So I would like to start by welcoming everybody here this morning. My name is Julie McDonough. I'm with Bremer Bank, and I'm your co-host. It's my pleasure now to announce um, the creator of this breakfast and the CEO of Good Leadership Enterprises, Paul Botts. So if the theme today is capturing the momentum, I want to just ask you to start thinking right now about where's the positive momentum in your life today? And when we're stuck, it's easy for the dark noise to consume us. It's easy for us to feel alone. I think you come to the Good Leadership Breakfast to avoid being stuck, to feed off the momentum of each other. And our job today is to capture that momentum and throw it forward out into a world that really needs us. This guy has a smile you will not forget. We hit it off in so many ways, and it just became completely obvious why the universe wanted this guy to close the Good Leadership Breakfast in November. Please join me in welcoming Greg Cunningham. Thank you, and good morning. Um, you know, Paul, as you were, as you were talking about um, where is the positive momentum in, in our lives, I was thinking about um, how aligned it is to actually what I want to talk to you about today, which is um, authenticity, um, because that's the one thing where um, I have recently found the courage to continue to show up um, as just my authentic self. Um, there's only one version of me, um, which is why I dress like a banker today. <laughs> there's some US bankers here today. They're looking at me like. <laughs> um, but authenticity really has been um, a critical element in, in, in my journey um, through corporate America. And I want to share with you how important I think it is um, in your success equation. Um, this notion of bringing your whole self, being uncompromising in who you are and what you value. Because what I think the, the most authentic leaders do and what good leaders do is they radiate goodness, right? When you see Paul and the minute you meet Paul, which is why I went, up, went right up to him when I saw him at that photo shoot, because there was just something about him, like this goodness just sort of radiated from him. And then he started talking about goodness. And I'm like, yeah, like it just, it, it just fit so well. I, um, I want to start um, by talking about what I do. Um, I lead global diversity and inclusion for U.S. Bank. Um, I've been married to Jack, Jacqueline Lloyd Cunningham for 26 years. My wife is here this morning. Um, we have two kids. My youngest, uh, Whitney, is studying uh, film and television production in Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University. Her dream is to be Shonda Rhimes. Right? I'm like, I'm good with that. <laughs> Let's do that. My son is, a, um, is on the East Coast. Um, he's in school at Williams College in Massachusetts. He's a student athlete, six foot two, 190 pounds, built nothing like his dad, you know, good looking, athletic, you know, and if he were standing here, you could tell he's a student athlete. And, you know, you would think baseball, football, maybe basketball. My son's a hockey player. Right? So we call him LeBron Gretzky. <laughs> and the, you know, the fact that you got that joke means the rest of this is going to go really well. <laughs> like, it's actually going to go really well from here on out. Um, <laughs> so on a much more serious note, um, let me talk about where it all started for me. Um, I was born in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania in the Hill, Hill, District, Hill District neighborhood of Pittsburgh, for those who know Pittsburgh. Um, my, my dad was a, a small business owner. He was a butcher. And this year, this April, we actually celebrated, not celebrated, that was definitely not the right word, we commemorated the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. And it was such a personal moment for me because I remember um, that day 50 years ago um, as a really, really young boy. Um, because my dad was a small business owner. And as many of you know, and those who may have been around or remember that time, um, most of the inner cities exploded with violence and unrest. And the day after Dr. King's assassination, my dad's butcher shop was looted and burned. And so I recall, you know, it was just that memory was seared so uh, deeply in my mind because I remember my dad often leaving the house to go to work he wouldn't come home. He would sleep in the butcher shop to make sure it didn't get looted and burned again. He opened four months later that September, um, and then he passed away um, that following summer. So my mom was a widowed mother of five. I was the youngest. 
And my mom sent me off to, um, as the youngest, she sent me off to a private school. We grew up in inner city, predominantly black neighborhood. She sends me to private school in a white neighborhood. When one of, I think there were like three black kids in the whole school. So I get there the very first day, I get called a racial thing and this whole you know, situation happens. And I remember throughout my, my career going to this school and how it ties back to authenticity is how many times I felt like and was told that I was less than, you know, either overtly or um, in, in a much more covert way. But it wasn't until I graduated from high school and where the affirmation came for me was when I went away to college and I went to a historically black college. But the year before I went, I visited a friend of mine in Atlanta and I was visiting with him on the campus and across the campus comes this woman who looks really, really familiar to me and she says, good morning, and she walks past us. And I said to my friend, like, why does she look so familiar? He's like, that's Coretta Scott King. I'm like, oh yeah, that's why she. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I've seen her somewhere before. <laughs> and it was just this moment where I went, I'm going to school here. And you know, everyone, the mayor of Atlanta was black, and the president of the school, and the janitor was black. But the reason that that was important for me is because I had been told throughout, all, up until that point, that I wasn't as, as good and I was less than. But it was this moment where you get on this campus where, and this is true of all of us, right? We want this, this sense of um, affirmation. We want a sense of self-worth. We want a sense of belonging. And there was this notion around everyone at that school understood my story. They understood my journey. They understood how, um, how I got there and why I was there. As I moved into the working world, moved into corporate America, I've worked for U.S. Bank is now my third Fortune 500 company I've worked for. You know, I always had this feeling um, deep inside of a bit of inadequacy. You know, I didn't go to a top 10 school. Um, you know, I did have an MBA, but it wasn't like the top 10 schools. And it wasn't until there was a moment I was at um, a company and our, our chief marketing officer used to have this Monday morning staff meeting. Monday morning, eight o'clock, uh, you know, typical, we've all been in these meetings, right? You, you go through the business of the day, you talk about priorities for the week. And towards the end of the meeting, there'd be maybe 15 minutes uh, left where you'd go around the room and everybody would sort of give an update on what they're working on, um, typical staff meeting. And I remember always having like that Sunday evening blues, you know, that, that Sunday evening feeling we all have when you think about what's coming up next week and there's this Monday morning meeting at eight o'clock and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what am I gonna talk about tomorrow? You know, sound smart, sound smart. You know, don't say anything, you know, and I would always go out and leave that meeting thinking like, oh, why did I say that? You know, I should have said it this way and you know, that sounded stupid, you know? And it, there, was, there was one day I, I went to the meeting and it, it came around to me and I said, you know, I'm just gonna talk about a personal experience that I, I, I had. And what I wanna share is I took my kids to see the, a movie this weekend. You know, we took our kids to see this movie called Aquila and the Bee. And if those of you who are familiar with the movie, Aquila and the Bee is about this little black girl who grows up in Compton, California. She ends up winning the script, the script spelling bee. Um, the story of the movie was less important than the movie itself. That was an independent film, and Starbucks was one of the underwriters of that film. And the reason that was important was because the CEO at the time, Howard Schultz, talked about the reason Starbucks got involved was because he wanted his employees and he wanted people to understand that Starbucks was in the experience business. They weren't in the coffee business, they were in the experience business. That coffee was the, was the vessel by which they delivered um, on this experience. And it started this whole conversation about, okay, so what business are we in? You know, yeah, we're in a retail business, but what business are we really in? And it was that moment where I just went, ah. you know, that moment where you could exhale. And our CMO kind of looked at me for the first, you know, where I felt like he really looked at me, like I see you right now, you know? And it's that sense of belonging, right? That sense of 
wow, like I am good enough. And all the stuff that I used to think about were a deficit for me, growing up in a single parent household in the inner city of Pittsburgh, going to a small black college in the deep south, you know, all those things that I used to, to hide from and sort of uh, uh, suppress, that actually was my superpower. You know, that perspective that I brought, that life experience was actually a benefit and if a company can sort of look at each of us individually and start to value that, imagine the power, which is fast forward how I got into the work of diversity and inclusion. I actually didn't choose this job at all. The job actually chose me. You know, as Paul said, I spent most of my career in marketing. And when the company first asked me to do diversity and inclusion, I was like, eh, I'm not even sure I understand what the job is, you know? like. <laughs> Really, I don't have an HR background, I don't have a diversity background, but, you know, but, it, but it seemed like at the time, like the, 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 the narrative that companies were putting out around diversity and inclusion needed to change. And how it ties back to good leadership, Paul, is how do we as leaders create space for all different kinds of voices? You know, good leaders make space for others. You know, it is about how do we all thrive, both personally and professionally? How do we thrive in a culture of, um, of shared accountability? And when I think of accountability, I think of, of, I think of it as in terms of accountability for each other. You know, how do we, how do we um, uh, take care of each other in these work environments? How do we create positive team environments? Um, that's, to me, a new narrative around what inclusion is. There are five things I think that are really important around authenticity. The first one is courage. Courage, I think, is the most important skill we can have because without it, think about how difficult it is to, to leverage any of the other skills with any consistency without courage. It has been the one that has been the toughest for me. It's been the one that's the longest journey, but it is foundational to everything else in how, you want, how I want to show up as a leader, in how I want to show up as a human being in the workplace. The second one is awareness. And when I think of awareness, I think about not only self-awareness for me, but how am I aware of difference of, of other people? How do I embrace difference? You know, when I think about in meetings, when, you know, you ever been in these meetings where like the same people's ideas are always the ones that win because they talk the most? Right? What good leaders do is they actually pull out the ideas from the introverts too, right? After the meeting, because the introvert might not want to share it in the meeting, you know? Or the guys who are always man mansplaining over the women, right? But it's being aware of these things and being aware of difference and being able to work across difference. The third one is purpose. And purpose, I love this one, because I was watching this TV show a couple of years ago, and there was this little girl um, on this show with the source of all truth in the world, right? Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> she, I mean, right? <laughs> but this little girl asked Oprah, she said, you know, Oprah, what advice would you give to a young girl to be successful? And Oprah said, as only Oprah could, She's like, I would give you the same advice I'd give any girl, or any boy for that matter, that the number one responsibility you have in life is to understand why you're here. Like I literally stopped in my tracks in front of the TV and was like, did she just say, you know, wow, like how powerful is that? And it sort of set me off on my own journey to understand why am I here? You know, I can keep doing these marketing campaigns or I can really start to be a force of change um, in a corporation and do this work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The next one is trust, which is really at the heart of authenticity, right? You can't have any, I don't care what relationship you're talking about, personal or professional, no relationship is gonna work if you don't have trust. And that's what authenticity is all about. Authenticity is about building trust, which is at the core of any healthy relationship. And then the final one is values. There is, no, there is no white space between who I am as a person and what my personal values are and what I get paid to do for US Bank. None. It's in complete alignment. 
And when I did the really hard work around purpose, it, it became a filter for me to decide what types of the work I would do, who I would do it for. And so understanding your values and what are the things that are non-negotiable for you? And does your work align with those personal values? It's a really important exercise to go through as you think about authenticity and good leadership. And so some of the things I, I think that good leaders do and how they exhibit good leadership is they share their story. Good leaders are vulnerable. Like they're willing to tell their story because in telling your story, you give, you give space for others to do, to do the same. You give license for others to share, to share their story as well. And that's all people want is a sense of belonging. I think as human beings, we want two things. First, we seek to understand. And the next, we want to be understood. And so as a leader, when you share your story, you give license uh, for others to do the same. I think good leaders also, um, as leaders, we're, all, we're, we're super hardwired to always show up with the answer because we're the leader. You know, and you're like, we got to be smart and we got to know the answer. But good leaders also show up as the student. Like, I love leaders who, who show up and don't always have to be the smartest person in the room. Like, they ask more questions than they answer. And so sometimes show up as the student and not always as the teacher. And then finally, I just want to say, you know, part of authenticity is really, you know, changing the narrative of what we say to ourselves about ourselves. You know, sometimes the biggest hurdle we have, the greatest obstacle is actually the voice that we share with ourselves. And it sort of stems from, you know, all of these other things that we've encountered in our life experience. And so when I talk about authenticity, it's sometimes changing the narrative of what we say to ourselves about ourselves. I don't have enough money, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough this. But oftentimes it's starting with what is in your toolbox and how do we share that with others? And so the work that I'm doing around inclusion, I believe, is really about creating um, space for difference, valuing difference, and allowing the organization to embrace that and take that um, into our business. And so I will pause there um, and thank you so much for having me. I know we'll have a chance to talk later, but I really appreciate being here this morning. It's been an honor. Thank you. As I was listening to your conversation with us, there were several different things that kind of stuck out to me. And I had sort of my mind made up about what I was going to ask you. And then you said, courage. That's the hardest one for me. Yeah. Will you tell us a little bit more about that? I think courage has been the toughest for me because courage is all about confidence. And I think, you know, as I was saying earlier, for so long, um, you know, if people tell you something enough times and over a longer period of time, you actually start to believe it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this experience I had as a really young child in, a, um, in this school environment where um, I was made to feel less than, I, I can't think of any other way to say it, um, but you start to believe it. And so, you know, stepping into the, the work world, I had to gain the confidence um, to courageously show up as who I was and to bring my full self and bring everything in my toolbox with mm -hmm. me. Um, it's been a journey. I mean, and it has taken me a long time to get to the point where I could sit up here with Pumas on and mm -hmm. say I'm a banker, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That, that was a thing. That yeah. was like a thing last night. Like, I do yeah. wear the Pumas, don't wear the Pumas, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Amen to and that. So can I right? get it, you know, <laughs> more fully, so, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Um, I'm also, you, you, you went so quickly through this, and I want, you, I want to take you back. I know you were very young, but will you tell us a little bit more about your dad, and maybe even how do you think you're like him? Yeah, um, you know, I didn't get to know him long. You know, I was, I was uh, my dad passed away before my sixth birthday. Um, he was a military veteran. Um, as I said, a small business owner. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understood he was a good swimmer. Um, I didn't learn to swim as a kid. I actually was afraid of the water, mm -hmm. so I became a self-taught swimmer as an adult mm -hmm. um, because of my dad and wanting to experience that. 
Um, but he was very much a, a you know, hardworking, introvert, family man. Um, my dad was one of those people who just you know, stressed family and keeping mm-hmm. family together and would do picnics in the wintertime, you know, just to get family together. Yeah. And um, I think that's what I take from him, is just uh-huh. this notion and this concept of the importance of family. That's a perfect transition. So you're an empty nester. Yes. Yeah, you, you told me you yes. sold the big house and moved into the city. Let's talk about that, right? Man, that has been fun. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, okay. So say more. Come on now. Yeah, no, uh-huh. we, uh, it was actually my daughter's idea a couple of years ago. We, um, you know, we were living in the, in the burbs, enjoying that, and it was great when the kids were little, but we both worked downtown, and our kids were in school downtown. And when our kids went off to college, um, we re- I mean, it probably took us two years just to decide what to do with stuff. Mm-hmm. And it really helped us, you know, have an appreciation for how much stuff you don't need. And just that decluttering um, was, man, it was just so um, cleansing, right, Jack? I mean, it was, and, but what's been cool about it is just finding this in this next chapter of our lives mm-hmm. is discovering, um, you know, each other again and dating my wife again mm-hmm. and, you know, it's just been so fun because we're learning even more about each other mm-hmm. in the process and what our interests are and how do you fill that time now, mm-hmm. you know, where you were running kids to events and soccer practice and hockey practice or whatever it was. And now we have time to do stuff that we enjoy doing. And so, you know, now we can read books again and go out to dinner and go out to dinner with friends. And, and I wanted to say this earlier, Paul, and I forgot, but um, we actually had dinner with some friends recently and I can't tell you how important this is. These are friends who don't always, you know those friends that you don't always agree with, like they don't really see the world as you do. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can't um, encourage you enough, you know, how important it is to spend time with people who don't see the world as you do. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it really helps you grow, you know, both personally and professionally. And you can debate with them and talk about whatever, politics, religion. Um, But we found time to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And just that discovery of, friendships and, um, and each other has been really, um, really cool for us. Let's talk about your kids a little bit. So you one on yeah. the East Coast, one on the West Coast, you're watching them from afar. Um, mm-hmm. So what do you see in them that you really like as they're living their lives? I, what I like about them is, was sort of the, the nature of your first question around courage and confidence. My kids are incredibly confident. Um, they don't have that same fear and hesitation that um, I did, you know, when I was that age. Uh, a really good example was my son. We were in New York City recently, and we were walking down Fifth Avenue in New York, and he sees, you know, I don't know, it was like Gucci or, you know, those stores on Fifth <laughs> Avenue, like those boutiques. And he just, he's like, oh, Gucci. Like, he just, like, walked in. Like, I'm going in, you know? Mm-hmm. And I would, you know, as a young, you know, teenage black boy, I would have never thought about going to like a Gucci, like they're gonna follow me around the store. And you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't have had the courage to just like walk in like I belong here. And like, you know, he was just walking around like show me the shoes that are $250 flip flops. And I was like, you ain't getting those, but I'm glad you You know, my mom was like, don't look at nothing, don't touch nothing. Cause you ain't getting nothing. But he just, but it, I just so admire that. Like he doesn't have that, neither one of my kids have that barrier of like, I don't belong. They just feel like, hey, like that we've been taught to, to think that we're as good as anybody else and we belong here just like anybody else. It's great stories. Thank you. Uh, so you're doing really, really important work, creating a sense of belonging inside US Bank around inclusion and diversity. Um, where do you see goodness in that work that we just might not be able to see from our perspectives? I see goodness in that um, people are starting to feel that U.S. Bank is a safe um, space, and I mean safe emotionally. Um, When I first took the job of uh, diversity and inclusion, um, I remember one of the first things we did is we went on a listening tour. You know, I really wanted to get a pulse of the organization. And before I rolled out like this grand strategy, I really wanted to understand, you know, what were the pain points and what were people feeling? And so we went on this listening tour and I'll never forget, I was giving, you know, I was giving the presentation and, 
you know, I'm sure we've all been there. You know, there's always one person in the audience who just is not like feeling what you're talking about. Like there was this guy in the back of the room, he's just sitting there like this the whole time. And, you know, and I'm thinking like, wow, like, you know, if I can reach him, you know, I'm good. And finally, at the end of the meeting, you know, he raised his hand and he said, I have a question. You know, I'm a middle-aged heterosexual white male and I want to know why there's no, you know, white male business resource group. And I like literally like ran over to him and I like hugged him. And he's like, why are you touching me, first of all? <laughs> like, what is going on? <laughs> and I said, no, the reason I did that is because I really appreciate you asking that question. Like, and I really feel like it's important that you ask that question because that had to take a great deal of courage for you to ask that. And to me, you know, the work of inclusion means everybody. It's not about excluding anybody. And I know we're on the right path when we have people who are willing to courageously ask those kinds of questions. And to me, that is good work um, because everybody feels um, a sense of belonging and everybody sees themselves enrolled in the work in some way. Thank you so much for sharing the time with us this morning. Thanks Let's give it up for Greg. Thank you.